is the day that the Lord has made. And then what's the rest of it? Can you finish it with me? And we will rejoice and be glad in it, won't we? So we are going to rejoice together today, and this is Communion Sunday, the first Sunday of the month, and we're going to spend a few minutes at the Lord's table today. But first, we want to begin, we got to get that blood pumping a little bit, and we want to sing some good hymns together. So Dave is going to come and lead us right now as we sing and lift up our voices in praise. David? Yes, let's all stand together as we sing. Praise Enjoy. Him, praise Enjoy. Him. Enjoy. Praise Him, praise Him, Jesus, our blessed Redeemer. Sing, O earth, His wonderful love proclaim. Hail Him, hail Him, highest archangels in heaven. Strength and honor give to His holy name. Like a shepherd, Jesus will guard His children. In his arms he carries them all day long. Praise him, praise him, tell of his excellent greatness. Praise him, praise him, ever in joyful song. Praise him, praise him, Jesus our blessed Redeemer. For our sins he suffered and bled and died. He, our rock, our hope of eternal salvation. Hail him, hail him, Jesus the crucified. Sound his praises, Jesus who bore our sorrows. Love unbounded, wonderful, deep, and strong. Praise him, praise him, tell of his excellent greatness. Praise him. May be seated as we sing our great Savior. Jesus, what a friend for sinners, Jesus, lover of. Friends may fail me, foes assail me, He, my Savior, makes me whole. Alleluia, what a Savior, Alleluia, what a friend, saving, helping, keeping, love. Hey! 
Okay, this morning we're tapping into the power of effective prayer. And how many you know that it truly makes a difference when we effectively learn and grow and speak to the Lord would guide us in? This, I think of last night, as you went to bed, you rested your head. Did you pray? When you arose this morning, did you pray before you got out of bed? When you arrived before the service, did you pray for your heart and for the preacher so the message could be clear to your heart? Did you pray for somebody else this morning? Even before I walked up here, somebody already laid their hands on me and prayed for me. And I'm so thankful for that because that's the power of God, the strength of God, the wisdom of God. And when I think of prayer, prayer is based on the connection and the relationship to the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And when you're faced with overwhelming problems in your life and when something bad unexpectedly happens in your life, the best thing to do is what? Pray. What's the most important thing we should be doing above all? Taking it, praying, taking it to the Lord, placing it into his hands and trusting him that he has a greater plan than we could ever put together. Some people's first response when they pray, they, they're angry before they pray or, or they, get, they complain to God or, or they panic instead of just taking it directly to the Father. And we're going to look into some deeper truths of prayer and worship this morning. So if you have your Bibles, if you don't, we could put it on the screen, James chapter 5, verse 13. And this is one of the versions, but the version that I like to use is the one we use here, is the New American Standard Version, but it says, if you're in trouble, pray. If you're happy, sing songs of prayer. And my version says, Is any one among you suffering? Let him pray. Is anyone cheerful? Let him sing songs of praise. And I want you to understand, is anybody suffering this morning? Having body aches, having problems, mentally, spiritually, emotionally. And, and we see that James gives perfect instructions of what to do, how to plug in to God. He says, personally and directly go to him. Three words, let him pray. Let him sing. So we know that has to do with prayer and worship. And why? Why? Why would we take it directly to God? Because he could change things. He could open new doors that we could never have opened. He could work in our heart like never before. The Bible tells us in Timothy there is only one God, one mediator between God and man and the man Christ Jesus. What is that saying? That God personally wants you to take it to him. Yes, he wants you to pray for somebody else, but he wants you to learn to come to him that he is a savior. I think of some time ago when a lady, I, I had, at the end of the service we call altar call, and a lady came up and I asked her, what is your request? What do you want me to pray for? And she said, why don't you let the spirit lead the prayer? And I said, okay, I prayed for her with all my strength, with all my heart. And I've seen tears coming down her eyes, and they were hitting my, my palms. And as she walked away, and um, I could see the brokenness of her. And, but I know that God did something, because that was a big smile as she was walking away. The next day, we happened to cross paths, and she said, Pastor, I just want to tell you, thank you so much for praying for me. She said, I didn't tell you, but I got cancer in my stomach. And she said, I said, oh, I'm so sorry. And she said, thank you for praying. I wasn't healed, but I was touched from God. And I said, it just confirmed that we need to pray. We need to learn to pray, not just for ourselves, but pray for other people as well. But the Lord is telling us, take it directly to him. 
what does effective prayer look like? I want to share with you this morning as we are in the book of James chapter 5, verse 16 and 17. And you're probably all very familiar with these scriptures. But I'm going to read it again because sometimes we might miss some deeper truth or deeper understanding of what the Bible says. The Bible says in James chapter 5, verses 16 and 17, Therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another so you may be healed. The effective prayer of a righteous man can accomplish much. Elijah was a man with a nature just like ours. He prayed earnestly that it might not rain, and it did not rain on the earth for three years and six months. And as we get to that point and we look at that, I want you to put your hand on your heart right now. I want you to put your hand on your heart. And the Bible says, James says very clear, are you suffering? And we're going to be very clear to tell the Lord what we're feeling and what we're doing. So if you would just keep your hand there, close your eyes, and trust that the Lord has his Father. We are suffering. We are heartbroken. But you, we know that you are able to heal us. And we know healing comes through forgiveness. Help us to forgive one another. I pray that you would touch our heart and we would hear your voice like never before, Father. Bring restoration to our bones and healing to our body, Father. We bring you all our cares and anxieties and concerns, Father, for we know you love us and you care for us. Thank you for filling us with the grace, the peace, and the, and, and, and the peace that surpasses the understanding, Father. We thank you, we love you, and we thank you for sending your only begotten Son that whoever believed would not perish but have eternal life. We pray all this in your precious Son's name. Amen. Amen. See, God, what, we, we, what kind of people does God hear or answer? The Bible tells us very clear. Him that confesses, him that prays for one another, him that is earnest and genuine before God. And, and how was Elijah described as a man like us? One version says he was human like us. How many humans do we have in the room? We're, we're all human. We're still here. We're not gone in spirit yet. We're not. James is, is, is truly driving us to help us understand what kind of people God hears or listens to. So the first point I want to make that God answers the prayers of imperfect people. Elijah was a man like us, the same phobias, the same imperfections. He had the same hurts, the same pain. He went through a lot of sacrifice and service for the Lord. In spite of all that, what do we know? That God heard this man. God heard this prophet. God spoke through this prophet. There was even a time in the Bible when you hear that a widow, her son was dying and Elijah came. And it says he put his hand over him and he prayed three times and the boy was healed. The boy was alive like never before. But in 1 Kings chapter 19, 1 through 4, I'm just going to read it. I'm going to take you back to his position of how he felt and what he was going through. And many of us have feelings, right? It's okay to feel. It's okay to have emotions. But our faith has to be bigger than what we face and our fears. In 1 Kings chapter 19, verse 1 through 4, I'm just going to read it through. If you're taking notes, 1 Kings chapter 19, verse 1 through 4, it says, now Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done, and now he had killed all the prophets with the sword. Then Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah, saying, so may the gods do to me even more if I do not make your life as the life of one of them by tomorrow about this time. Verse, verse 3, and he was afraid and arose 
and ran for his life and came to Beersheba, where, which belongs to Judea, and he left the servant there. But he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness. He came and sat down under a Jupiter tree, and he requested for himself that he might die and said, It is enough now, O Lord, take my life, for I am not better than my father's. And I just want to stop there as we, as we, of what this man was going through. We know Ahab was one of the most wicked kings of Israel. We know that he introduced Baal worship. And we know that he was married to Jezebel, a woman, his wife, that was even worse than him. And she sent a life, she sent a, a death threat to Elijah. So he runs to the desert. And as he's in the desert, he's going through a lot of emotions and desperation. Have you ever been there? Have you ever been in a place of desperation where you didn't know what to do, where to go, or what to say? The first thing we see that he was afraid. And many times if you feel afraid, I've always said, I remember the Psalms. I remember Dave, Dave, King David crying out to the Lord, and he made it so simple. Turn to me, Lord. Answer me. You are the stronghold of my life. You are my light and my salvation. But we know that he was fearful. He wasn't afraid of 400 prophets of Baal, but he runs from a woman and runs into the desert. Have you ever felt afraid or intimidated by your circumstances? And many times there's two cho choices that we could make. We could be stuck, we could be angry, we could fall into panic, or we could reach out to God. Because he is right there. And as pastors, sometimes when we get phone calls from people we haven't heard from a long time, it kind of questions and brings some fear to our hearts. We are human. It brings fear to our hearts. And I want to tell you why. In the last two weeks, three deaths in the last two weeks. One through, it was a fatal accident, and the other two, two men were gunned down and shot and killed. These are crises. And I am reminded, when we're going through these times, God said, remember what Paul told Timothy. In 2 Timothy 1.7, I'm reminded to tell the families, you have the Spirit of the Lord in you. We will walk with you. We will be there for you in good and bad times. The Bible says that God did not give us a spirit of fear, but a power, love, and a sound mind. We have to come back to the place of understanding that the Lord poured His Spirit into our hearts that we have the same love that he has. We have the same power and the same understanding. We, it also says he ran for his life, meaning he felt overwhelmed by his problems. Next point. He felt overwhelmed by his problems. Have you ever felt overwhelmed by certain situations that you're in? Have you ever felt like running away and just saying, I'm leaving everything, I'm leaving everyone, I'm going to start a new life? Have you ever felt like escaping? There was a man in the Bible that felt that as well, and his name was Jonah. This is a man that only, not only ran from God, he ran from delivering the message to the Ninevites. And then he gets into the boat, and he tells the sailors, throw me overboard. He tried to take his life. He knew he could not survive in the sea, in the storms of the sea. We cannot survive in the storms. We need, we need to return to our foundation and what we believe and what we trust. I know that the Bible says that the Lord sent a whale to swallow him up. And three days and three nights he was there before he reached out to the Lord. He was in there three days and three nights. Can you imagine? I've been there. I've been on the run in the past, my past life. From Christ, from the authorities, and from the law. 
And it was one of my biggest falls. And I want to tell you, I know what he was feeling. No peace. No peace of mind. Afraid. Lonely. Afflicted. The Bible says he, because of his affliction. But what does he do in that affliction? I was there. I was in a prison cell. When I reached out to the Lord. And I said, Lord, I know you can do something. I know you don't have to get a visiting pass. I know you can just show up. And he showed up. He showed up and he showed up. He showed me who he truly was. And this is how God is telling us to go. James is saying, go directly to him. Build a personal thing with him. If you're in trouble, you're worried, you're overwhelmed by things, come to him. Then we hear that Elijah he requested that he would die. Lord, just take my life. We know that he was depressed and he felt hopeless. And many times I've I, I worked with many people that come under depression and anxiety and all that. And I thought of it, I'm like, have I ever fell into it? Have I been there? And, and, and I realize if you look at the statistics, of pastors and what they go through and the pressure and the overwhelm, sometimes they could fall into this. And many, some of them have taken their own life. And that's why it's so important that we be there for them. And I, I, I thank God for Pastor Gary and Joy. I think of God as like, I have my tool bag here this morning. And the tool bag, I believe that they're one of the, some great tools that God has in his toolbox. And he says, here, I brought them to you. We have to know how to use our tools. This is one of the tools. This could be used for good, or this could be used for bad. We have to know how to use our tools. And they are great tools. Pastor Gary has been a great mentor a great pastor, a great prayer warrior. They have been, their joy in them have been totally full on. Love them. Tell them how much you appreciate them. Continue to exhort them as they exhort you and always have bring something forth. Have you ever been in a place where you felt like you didn't want to get out of bed? Well, you're just like, I'm not getting up today. I'm staying in bed. Have you ever felt like the world, your family, the faith, your future was falling apart? Well, Elijah felt the same thing. Jonah felt the same thing. He dealt with anger. He dealt with fear. He dealt with resentment. He dealt with worry and loneliness. And the lesson is very simple this morning as we look at the scriptures. You don't have to be perfect to pray. You don't have to be perfect to see your prayers answered. In in verse 18, James 5, 18, we read that he prayed again and the sky poured rain and the earth produced its fruit. Did you hear that? Seven, he came seven times. He prayed and on the seventh time, it says that it was like a cloud, like a man's hand. That small. And Elijah saw it. And he was like, here comes the rain. He trusted God that he was going to pour. And he did pour. Elijah was a man like us. And God answered him. So I want you to tell, I want to show you three prayers that God will always answer. And I want you to understand that the will of God is perfectly in the word of God. What kind of prayers does God answer? In in, in James chapter 1, verses 5 and 6, we know you know these scriptures, but I want to remind you, James says, if anybody lacks wisdom, have you ever lacked wisdom in a certain area? Oh, I'm not a professional. I don't have skills in that certain area. He's saying, James says, let him ask of God, who gives to all men, generously, without reproach, without scolding, without a lecture, but he just brings it forth. 
He says, let him, let that person. God is personally saying, come to me. Come to me. And God wants to help us on the way we respond and to do it in faith. So if anybody lacks wisdom, let them ask of God. And then in the next scripture, it says, verse 6, but let him ask in faith without doubting. See, we need the wisdom to see things in God's perspective. We need to ask him to help us see the good out of the bad when bad comes. Because we know that God works all things together. I know when I'm going through hard times, one thing, Romans 8, 28, I never forget. I'm always reminded that God makes, works all things for good, even when it looks bad. It doesn't mean that he's always going to answer all your questions, because a lot of times we have more questions than answers. But it does mean that he wants to awake our spiritual senses and develop that trust and wisdom. Even when it looks bad, God has always been good and that word good it, it's it's so much more than we could ever imagine he shows up he shows up he he's always present when two or more are it, praying together what does he say that he'll show up he's in the midst he's been there he's available he doesn't have an answering machine you don't have to make an appointment james is saying let him ask just come to him. Be real. Lay it all down. God could do something with that. So we know the point is, pray for God's wisdom and knowledge. Pray for it because we know, you know in Proverbs it says, for the Lord gives wisdom and from his mouth comes knowledge and understanding. How many ever lack knowledge and understanding? I like it all the time. I'm one of the slowest learners of all times. But you know what? It helps me. I read it. I write it. I speak it. I pray it. I trust it. I meditate on it. It will help you. We need to get so familiar with it because when we're in trouble, when we're worried, what, what does James say? Just go to God. <laughs> go directly to him. You don't need an iPhone or an iPad, you don't, we just need the I am in our lives. And the next thing, the next point I want to make is in Genesis 1.26, the Bible tells us that, that he made us in his image. And the point is that we, we have to pray and thank God for allowing circumstances you know, I get the next point. We need to pray and thank him for allowing our circumstance to help us become more like his son, Jesus. You know, when we're going through those things, if you remember, I always go way back to the beginning because I want to understand. And it says in, in Genesis 1.26, let us make man in our image, in our reflection, and in our resemblance. If you guys remember in the Old Testament, what led people astray? The images they worship, the statues, it led people astray. But God said, I made you according to my likeness, the sameness, my identity. You're part of God's DNA. He made you with a purpose. And we know in 1 Thessalonians 5.18, it says we are to give thanks in everything, for this is God's will. Have you been thanking him, thanking him lately? Sometimes we can complain more than we pray, or we could worry more than we pray, or we could fall and feel overwhelmed more than we pray, or we could be, lose the battle in the mind. I know if we lose the battle in the mind, we've lost it. Because mentally, spiritually, and physically, God wants to work in all those areas. And the last thing, I want you to know that in James chapter 1, verses 3 and 4, the Bible tells us, knowing that the testing of faith produces endurance, and let endurance have its perfect result, that you may be perfect, complete, and lack nothing. Did you catch that through our imperfections? 
God saying, I can make you complete, whole, if you, you have to go through this. There's no way around. You have to go through the testing. This is part of growing up. This is part of our character. It's refining. It's helping us grow up. And for, uh, the third point is that we pray for endurance and perseverance. Pray for endurance and perseverance. I had a friend who, a friend of ours who was told to, by the doctor that she had a short time to live, you know? She had full-blown cancer. It, it spread through her whole body. The doctor told her, it spread through your whole body. We don't, we don't think you're going to, you know? And it's many years later, guess what? She says, if I can't be cured, I must learn to endure. Seven years later, guess what? She's still around. <laughs> That's how God, our, it's bigger than we can understand. And the thing is, I, I'm so thankful for this group, this, uh, this outreach that we also do with Accountability Brothers. And it's outreaching to the inmates and helping them as they transition from prison into society. I've working with men that have spent more than a decade in the prison system. We get the opportunity to work with them hand in hand, walk with them, assist them into, back into society. And they become some of the biggest bond servants of God, brothers, fathers, godly husbands. Not only do we get them back into society, but we get them into serving the community. And I just want to show you some pictures of even my own. This is, this is a, a couple, and he was a young man. He spent a big percentage of his teenage years in the prison system. But God got a hold of him early, and now he's going to... They also do laundry love. They're a big part of laundry love, but they're also a big part of accountability brothers now. And, and we're working with men. Can I get another picture? These are my dear blood brothers, and they're serving, and they're with me. And God, my brother on the left-hand side, Jesse, this is Samuel and Jesse. And Jesse was given, was going to be given a life sentence. But the Lord turned things around. The Lord heard our prayers, and here he is today. And, and, there, and also we work with other men, we work with two men that have been, here's another brother that, that um, I grew up with. He, he graduated from the Salvation Army. And, and he, there he is with his son. As you see, he's becoming a father. He's becoming a godly husband. He's becoming the man God called him to be. And we even work with two men that have given, been given life sentences. And they appealed, appealed in faith, believing, and they're with us today. They will be in the next service. But it just shows the power of effective prayer, that we can go directly to God. And if you guys remember how I started in verse 16, James 5, 16, therefore confess to one another and pray for one another so you may be healed. What is that saying, Pastor? That is saying that we need to be fair. We need to have forgiveness in our heart towards one another. We need to be thoughtful. And if there's anything going on, like the end of the service, there was a pastor in his congregation. He was speaking to his congregation at the end of the message. And he, he, he was bringing conviction to the heart. And this was the question. Does, has, any, has everybody forgiven their enemies? Or has everyone forgiven somebody that hurt them? 80% of the congregation raised their hands in agreement. So he repeated the question, has everybody forgiven somebody in their lives that hurt them, that spoke down on them, that afflicted, brought affliction to them? They all, had, they all responded this time except one elderly woman. She walked up to the altar, and the pastor said to her, have you not forgiven your enemies? 
She said, I don't have any enemies, Pastor. He said, I just want to ask you a question. How old are you? She said, I'm 98 years old. She said, he said, would you turn around and tell the congregation how for 98 years of your life, you have never had a single enemy in your life? So she turned around, and the room was dead quiet. And she said, I outlived them all. <laughs> and, and I want you to think about that as we close in prayer. If there's any, but we picked up communion. And communion is very sacred and meaningful. And we know that God has forgiven us. And we know that God has freed us. And that God wants to touch our lives again. Then we need to be in that place to receive that says, therefore, if you confess, confession, forgiveness, and prayer, that you could be free. And we need to free ourselves. The worst prison I've ever been in is not the California state prisons, but in resentment, in bitterness, in woundedness, and in unforgiveness. Let's never be there. Church, let's never make room for that. God says to open our heart. Let's pray. Father, we thank you because you are the ultimate forgiver. You have shown us mercy. You have graced us. You have loved us. You have forgiven us. You've been there for us no matter what we've done. We pray that we would be thoughtful and caring and loving to one another, that we would not gossip, but we would share the gospel with one another, that we would not be mad at each other, but that we would love one another. And as the family, you've called us to be whole, to be healed, and to be brand new. I pray a blessing over your children, over your people. Keep your hand upon them. Keep them far from evil. And may they know that they can turn to you. They could ask for your blessing. They could ask for forgiveness. And that you would always answer the prayers of those who trust you with all their hearts. They lean not on their own understanding. They acknowledge you and they surrender and commit to you in all their ways, Father. Bless them, be with them, and continue to work through our hearts as we go throughout the week. We pray all this in the mighty name of your beautiful Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. <laughs>